nice things, but I'm, I'm the, you know, I'm the quick and dirty visualize, right? Just want to sort of see quick results and, and Martijn is more into the proper visualization things. Um, as um, Berenice has uh, the information sent around, the, the, the slides are all on GitHub. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm going through an HTML because I think that renders a little bit uh, better if you want me to do live things and change things. And so I can switch to RStudio and try to do it there, but I'm not really a sort of fluent in fluent RStudio user. Uh, you can also, um, from the slides, you can find, uh, actually you can go to this GitHub site and at this GitHub site, you will find this stars.rmd. You can load that into our studio and then click knit and then the whole thing should be run or you can run individual sessions and so on. So this is an R markdown file that um, that uh, has everything uh, in it. Um, uh, right, so this is the way that you could set it up. Um, it, it might be best to use the development version of STARS, which is easy to install. It's pure R. It has no dependencies except for the SF package, uh, but uh, you can install that from CRON. Um, and there is a, a, a larger data set you don't have to install, but you can do it. It contains a couple of sort of real-sized uh, satellite images, including a Sentinel-2 images. The whole package is like a gigabyte or so. So that's why I I put it on a different site, uh, not on Chrome, uh, because it's this kind of uh, material that we can use. You can throw it away after after we've done. So, what are data cubes? Um, data cubes are, you know, a kind of more complex tables, right? So, data cubes have a long uh, history. Let me just switch to this view, uh, and I will just go back to. I think they go back to the the so-called OLAP cubes which are online analytical processing cubes, which are things that, that appeared somewhere in the 80s or 90s, uh, where people you know, looked at tables and so on, and then they said, yeah, tables is fine, but quite often we have things that are arranged by kind of multiple dimensions. Yeah, for instance, the classical example is where you have uh, warehouse data, uh, you have different warehouses in different cities, uh, uh, a large number of products, and then you have sales, sale numbers over time, right? So that gives you three kind of keys to index the data and the, the data can, can be thought as a cube. But this is a literal cube of three dimensions, but we typically take the idea for multidimensional array data. So that is n-dimensional cubes. Cubes can be two-dimensional, can be one-dimensional, but then, you know, why, why call it a cube? And it can be like five or 10-dimensional, although it will be hard to, hard to find those. Um, so they are not strictly three-dimensional, they can be n-dimensional, and st standard tables as we know them uh, are basically one-dimensional cube. They are arranged according to whatever, their row numbers or something like that, but they are not multi-dimensional. But a lot of multi-dimensional data is stored in one-dimensional tables. So we will look at that and, and see how data, how data frames relate to data cubes and go through examples. So raster data sets are specific cases of uh, data cubes uh, but there are also factor data cubes that we will run into. The package stars, I started writing that, I think like three or four years ago um, to basically have um, an entrance for data cubes, uh, including raster data that works, works well together with the SF package that nowadays a lot of people uh, use for, for feature data, for, for vector geometries, point lines and polygons. So let's go to a very simple example a uh, socioeconomic data set uh, uh, called product that is found in the package PLM for panel linear models. And you see that here, these are panel data. Panel data are time series data uh, where we have data collected on a set of subjects. It could be persons, companies, countries, states, and so on uh, that make them, and that makes them multidimensional and spatial temporal, right? Because we have several persons, they are items in space and we have Sequence of time or for uh, which we have, uh, we have data collected. Um, right. So here is the sort of the first uh, set of, uh, of of entrance of these data. You see that we have states, and the states there are all the fifty states from the United States, and we have year that runs. This is our only first six records that goes, I think, over seventeen years, and then we have uh, um, a number of uh, variables, uh, including P capital, highways, a water, a water metric, some kind of thing with utilities and then thing uh, related to employment. So all kind of socioeconomic indicators. 
Now we can, for instance, use ggplot to just uh, plot these data, plot these uh, these uh, public capital variable as a function of state and year, right? And what we then get is kind of a raster image. Yeah, it's an, it's an image in any case where we have year on one axis and state on the other. So this is a spatiotemporal uh, plot uh, where we just have labels for states and numbers for years, but we know what I mean. And what we then see is, is uh, extremely boring, actually. What we just see is the difference between states. Yeah, and then we can look, look at the state. You see here, New York is very large, California. So this is basically uh, the effect that larger states have more capital, right? So we don't see much in the, in the temp happening in the temporal axis. There might be a, a signal, but we don't see it because it is sort of the whole thing, looking at it like this, is dominated by the difference in size in, in states, right? So one thing that you would then immediately uh, if you want to look at sort of uh, signals in these data, like where are these states going, then you would want to normalize them and say, okay, we want to take out the size effect of the state and, for instance, um, divide by, you know, divide by the, 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 the state, by the average of the time series. Yeah, we could do that. That is one way of doing that, or you could subtract that. That's another way. So what we do is we put it in the stars, uh, um, we convert it into a stars object, and that is basically a, a two-dimensional array that has nothing special. You could also do it in a regular uh, matrix. This is this does adds very little compared to a matrix. It just adds basically the state names for the for the dimension state, and it it says that I have years one uh, uh, seventeen years that sort of uh, start in in eighty six uh, that end in eighty six and then and then go down. It doesn't matter. So we have the different variables here uh, sort of listed as attributes. Yeah, and then we have sort of lay them out now in a two-dimensional structure, we see that the dimension table here at the bottom tells that we have basically one dimension state and one dimension year. Yeah? So we have two dimensional data here. The next thing is that we're going to uh, apply something. We're gonna apply a function to the first, uh, uh, over, uh, over the levels of the first uh, dimension. Uh, that means that basically that we, that we work over the second dimension. And what we do here is basically taking the values and dividing them by their mean. So we take out, we, we divide by the mean of the, of the time series, and by that we essentially uh, filter out the size effect of the state, right? We normalize by state. And we get a similar thing that looks very similar, um, just it has now switched, uh, switched names, but it doesn't matter really much. Uh, and we can sort of write that out yeah, by sort of moving that into a data frame again, and then we see that that all these variables are now suddenly normalized. They have different values. And if we do the same plot again on the new data frame, then we see that we that all the colors of the states are similar, right? But we see that some states go from light to dark, meaning that they have decreasing values over the 17 period, 17 year period, and other states have increasing values because they go from dark to light. Yeah. So we see that there is a very different signal, different states do different paths over the 17 year period. And we did that by essentially kind of sweeping over one dimension in this, in this data set. Now this is very, still very little to do with, really with uh, space and time. These are just numbers and these are just labels. Yeah, so there's nothing, there's nothing geographic in it in the, sense of, uh, in the sense of states. But we can glue, we can instead of the state names, we can actually glue the state geometries to that. And I just, did that, I did that in the past, I did that sort of half an hour ago, so this might not be in the slides that you looked at earlier, but if you would refresh them, you would see that. We can take the states from the package maps that has a comma map state that maps you the states. We have to throw out restricted Columbia because that's not in the product data set. And we have to do a match, but then we have to sort of take care of that in one data set, uh, New York has an underscore and the other state is that New York has a space between the two words. Yeah, so we need to take care of that. And then we see that that we have essentially an alphabetic ordering in both. That is very convenient that a lot of data sets do that. So we don't have to reorder one according to the other. We can just brutally sort of plug in the state geometries and then we get the same data set. But instead of, uh, instead of uh, the state, we see here that we have 48 uh, things that are called SFC that are now geometries, multi-polygon geometries, right? So we have a sequence of 48 
geometries that are uh, that have reference system WGS84. We can then, for instance, uh, take the first um, uh, sorry take the first year as a slice, and then we get essentially a dimension with range from one to one. We can drop this dimension here with a drop, and then we sort of get rid of it. So we have just the first year. We have just have the, all the variables for the first year and for all states. And then if we plot that, if we convert that into a simple features object and plot that, we get essentially a, a, a set of maps that shows the spatial variability for the first year. Yeah? So this is kind of a time slice that we have now, uh, that we have now done. Um, let me just see, are there any, whether there are any questions on the chat? Uh, if there are any, then, then I don't see them. Right, but uh, so if anyone sees a question, then sort of uh, I need to be I need to be informed. Uh, I don't so, think there is any question yet. Good. Okay, but please tell me when when there is because I yeah. don't get a no I don't get notified. I don't see it on the screen. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So region has no variability. The other ones have, and this is kind of a time slice through this data set where we see the variability of the different variables, you have the different attributes. And alternative, we could pick one attribute and then give the 17 maps of this attribute, sort of how it develops over time. That would be, would have been an alternative, possibly more exciting, uh, possibly more exciting uh, view. In this view, all the, all the variables have been, essentially have been stretched and they don't have a common legend. So this is already uh, what I call a vector data cube because it is vector data and it is time, right? And we have sort of variables that vary according to, uh, to both. An alternative is uh, the data set that we use a lot in this SF package, North Carolina SITS data set. SITS stands for Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Um, that package is loaded like this. Uh, we get an, an we get an, um, an uh, which is the basic uh, with uh, with a geometry column, which has somewhere with at every record the, uh, the geometry of the county re register, um, and what it has is a couple of variables, um, burn dimension the counties. Another dimension, the variable. So which variable is this about? These are the three variables, and which has as a third dimension the years, which are only two years present in, in this data set. Yeah, so we can uh, we can get that, and we can uh, in this in this case we only have uh, we have as county we have only the names, just like in the previous one. And what we're now going to do again is use the geometry uh, from the original data set to replace these 100 names with their respective geometries. And right then we have a real spatial vector data cube, which has these 100 uh, vector poly uh, multipolygons, so the, so the 100 geometries for the first dimension, and uh, the variable and the year as the second and third dimension. Yeah? So we can do this plot, for instance, uh, here we are uh, applying uh, a function called sum. Yeah, so we sum basically and we do that over the first and second. That means that we sum the years. Yeah. So we run this function. We iterate it over all instance of the first and second, over all county and over every variable. So we sum the two years that we have, and by that we re we reduce essentially this variable uh, a year into the sum of the, 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 the sum of those, and then we can plot that and we get the three variables. Uh, for um, uh, when summed over the summed over the year, uh, plotted uh, by county, right? And of course, this is sort of squeezed into one uh, into one uh, common legend, and we see that the births is of course a large, and the and the SID values are uh, 
sit the sentence infant death values are very uh, very low because this is a very rare disease luckily so we see that but anyway we still see some variability because uh, the the color breaks that are chosen uh, are, are chosen by quantiles of the data so we still have in this low data in, in these low numbers we have a little bit of variability now these are not sort of really very meaningful data to look at in, in this in this terms if you think of epidemiological effects again because of course when we have more people living in a particular county we also expect to have more uh, disease cases right so the pattern that we see is essentially that we see a strong correlation of uh, birth yeah because birth is, is essentially a proxy for the for the population of this county and the disease cases uh, and um, that, and that is something that we want to that we want to get rid of because it is obvious so we want to get uh, from uh, absolute numbers which basically have population in them we want to go to uh, to incidence rates right that is a standard thing to do in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, epidemiology is that you go from counts of a disease that you basically divide them by the population and you and you normalize that to something uh, that is then uh, divided by uh, the total counts over the total population yeah? so that we get uh, a risk uh, yeah this is this is essentially a, a fraction and this is sort of the global fraction that we expect so we get a standardized incidence rate that is larger than one when this state has more than uh, the global average of of incidences and it's smaller than one when it is uh, lower when it has lower incidences yeah so the value one is for this standard incidence rate is kind of a thing that is of interest to look at uh, we can do that uh, by essentially by uh, lowering the dimension what we now do is, is splitting is basically distributing the second uh, the second dimension which was uh, this variable birth uh, uh, sit and non-white birth over attributes and then we get a two-dimensional array which only has the the counties and the years and which has three uh, attributes yeah so we see them as three attributes so we lower the dimensionality of the array we have now these three attributes and then we can um, uh, here we basically we sum by the category uh, and we get the sums of the births the sits and the non-white birth and we can get the global incidence rate basically by uh, taking the uh, the, the second yeah the sort of the the total sits divided by the total births yeah so that we get now the denominator of this uh, of this ratio and now we can for each of the uh, counties we can uh, do the other sort of the other fraction um, so we have the uh, denominator and now we can the other fraction we basically uh, apply overall dimensions yeah over uh, over each uh, of the states and each of the years we uh, basically take this ratio we take the ratio of the sits over the births and then do that for every state and year every state and year and then we get uh, and then we divide that one by the global mean yeah which is the sort of the, the reference the reference value of the whole state state of uh, north carolina and then we plot that and uh, we do that we basically plot that and we get the two years uh, that come out of that come out of this um, and uh, here you see that basically here the 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 effect of population size has been uh, largely reduced uh, if not completely cancelled out and you see that the color scale that i took a bit of an, an effort to pick particular color breaks because i wanted to have the break uh, the value one in the middle and i wanted to use a particular color scale uh, that has that is a diverging color scale and we can see here that we have we get white values for one and that we get increasing blue values for lower than one when it gets lower than one we get increasing red values when it gets larger than one so this is a case where you want to basically show two things is it lower or is it larger or, or smaller than one and uh, how large is it yeah, so the red values are increased higher incidence rates and the blue values are uh, lower incidence rates than the than the the, the state uh, the state average yeah, so this is a way where we have a three-dimensional uh, raster uh, sorry a three-dimensional vector data cube and um, and and sort of standardize them to uh, standardized incidence rates 
Um, there is a little, uh, there is more to do with, um, uh, and I will briefly go there. Now, this is a link that, you know, short while may not work anymore because we are kind of rewriting this, this book entirely. This is a book uh, about spatial data science that I'm writing together with uh, Roger Bivent. Um, and that has an, a couple of other examples with, uh, with vector data cubes. One is uh, where we have uh, air quality stations that we, that we look at. And here you see the station number and here you see the time and you see sort of the distribution of, of values and the intensity of the values were uh, measured over the, different, over the different stations. And there we can compute means for stations and we can compute means by, by area and so on. And we can do um, um, spatial slices, meaning time series of them. But a more interesting case is here, the one where we looked at origin destination uh, uh, data, where we have for a set of regions, this is data from the UK, that's actually open data for a set of regions. We have uh, for every region, uh, we have how many people uh, live there and work in every other region, yeah? So this is like, a relationship we have an n by n relationship for every uh, for every um, um, uh, region we know how many people go there how many move there how many move there how many move there and so on how many move to the city center and uh, also their mode whether they go there by car or by bus or by train or by bike or by foot I think something like that right here it is bicycle foot car driver and train those are the four options so it is this is about movement data and where people move and how they move uh, we can sort of um, do a couple of tricks with, uh, with as you see here, with, with tidyverse machinery and move this into an array. That is what I'm going to do, where I have one dimension, the origins, and the other, the destinations. Yeah? So I'm going to make this a full two by two uh, outline, uh, which is a three dimensional um, uh, matrix with origin, destination, and mode. And you see here, that we have the origins, which are the, the geometries, we have the destinations, which are also the geometries, and we have the mode. So for bicycle, uh, foot, car, and train, we have uh, all, for all, every combination of origin and destination, we have the number of people uh, going there. And then there's a couple of, uh, couple of uh, manipulations. For instance, here I do a slice uh, for a particular destination, where the destination is this, is this 33, is the city center, and then we can see where people come from and what transportation they take. Yes, so you can see that a lot of people taking the bike sort of don't come from so far by foot. They are, they are really close. And the people who come by car are come from much farther away. And this is by slicing, basically looking at the city center, the destination 33. Uh, and then and you could do that for every destination, right? So you can do this here and you can do all kinds of uh, sums and 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 uh, and here we have um, uh, different ways of looking at at what what people uh, what where people come from and where they where they go to. Yeah? So this is this is a way of, uh, of of dealing with that with that kind of data. Uh, now let me just go back um, to the thing where I was. Yep. Um, right, so why do we do this? Aren't data frames and or, or tibbles, aren't they kind of good enough? Well, actually you can do everything with data frames and with tibbles. The thing is that it is a lot more organization because you have to deal with these different dimensions that are basically also attributes in your, that are uh, variables in your, in your data frames. And you basically, you never know, and there's a couple of things that you really don't know whether all of the combinations of the dimension levels are actually filled um, uh, because they might be empty. And when, when, they're, when, they're em when there are cells empty, that might mean that there is a zero, like in the origin destination case, or there is an NA. And if these, if these records are actually not present in your data set, you have to make kind of uh, implicit assumptions about that. Yeah? So that is, uh, in, in a certain respect, is, is, a, is a disadvantage. Yeah? Also, if you have very large data, then this approach may be more efficient to get things because you don't have to search because your data are automatically indexed that your dimensions are your indexes and you have more than one index on your data, basically space and time and other things that can that index your data. 
That is not the case when you have a table or a data frame. When you have a data table, of course, you can create these indexes and so on again. Uh, so there might be reasons to do this or to not do this. Um, uh, right, so, you know, there's a lot of people nowadays saying, well, we can, if we have petabytes of data, we just throw them in Google BigQuery, GIS, and so on, and we don't look back, and we just wait until the result is there, um, which might also work. Um, now we move into uh, raster data cubes. So raster data cubes, the simplest example of a raster data cube is essentially that of a single raster layer or a raster map. Right, so anyone is probably familiar that in spatial data we have this dichotomy of things that are sort of completely free and where they are in, in two-dimensional space, points, lines, polygons. You can have uh, you can have infinitely exact uh, coordinates for pointing out where something is, and on the other hand, we have raster data where we have values sort of in a regular array in a sort of an image form for sort of for all pixels. Uh, we have we have values. Uh, but the pixels are basically laid out regularly, and that is that is useful for certain things, for instance, for continuously varying things like interpolated surfaces or something like that, uh, or just if you observe images, yeah, if you take an image with your with your camera, with your phone, uh, or if you retrieve a satellite image, uh, or then it's created on or then it's available on a raster, or a lot of uh, modeling data, for instance, if you would look at weather data. You could look at weather stations, but a lot of weather data like uh, reanalysis, so basically output of weather models, and that is that comes typically as, as raster data. Now, raster data is not, you know, is not a very simple thing. Uh, here we read a, a, a raster file with uh, from the package raster actually um, with the with the command read starts, uh, and it's it's reading it from this from this system. So it's it's a it's a it's a demo data set that is available in this raster package. Okay, we get a summary of the attribute. We have a lot of NAs, uh, and we see that it's an 80 by 115 uh, uh, raster, which has a description of its coordinate reference system and a couple of other things. Like it tells you uh, where uh, where the sort of where the, the raster map starts, or where the left edge of the uh, raster is, uh, what the cell size is, and in this case, what the top uh, coordinate, y coordinate, the top of the top of your map is and that you have uh, a negative delta, negative cell size, which means that increasing rows means that the y axis decreases, right? If you go down, your rows increase. This is how images are typically organized, uh, but the, core, the y coordinate sort of goes up when you go north, right? So that, that this, this minus basically indicates there is, a, there is an, uh, a different direction there going on. So here I plotted this map uh, simply uh, with the spirit so you it's a, it's an old sort of uh, data set that is uh, that has a long history um, raster files are actually data cubes yeah because we have two dimensions right and it happens that both dimensions are regularly discretized and both dimensions are basically uh, cut up the space but they cut it in a very different way than the origin destination matrix because origin and destination both were geometries that spanned both dimensions. Every polygon in the origin and in the destination was two-dimensional. And here, this is a one-dimensional thing. This basically says, these are my columns. Yeah, this is my x. This goes over x coordinate. This, these are my rows. This goes over the y coordinate. Right, so uh, what we get then is for every combination of row and column or x and y, we get a value um, vector data cubes have x and y space in every single dimension that is spatial, right? So this is very difficult, they're very different. Uh, in this example, we have a regular grid. That means that we have an offset and a delta. So we have raster cells that have a constant cell size over each of the dimension. And then it happens even that uh, the cell size is identical. They're both 40, so we have square cells. Yeah, but that, that, that doesn't have to be always the case. Um, Right, so then we can, if we have that, if this is regular, then with offset and delta, we can basically compute coordinates from indexes i, uh, and also do the other way around if we if we want to. I discussed that delta is for y is often negative, and that we have a reference system which basically tells you uh, uh, how we should understand these 
uh, coordinate values when we sort of want to combine them with other spatial data. Yeah? So it's a coordinate reference system. Um, I can move this into an, uh, an SF object simply by sort of telling them, and I'm not going to remove all the missing values that are here because here you see here are missing values that are just not colored. But this is a this is dense grid. Just to show you that this is a dense grid, that everything is there. I'm basically creating now um, little square polygons. So uh, here you see the square polygons, and I colored the border of either of each polygon in a gray color, and I filled them with this same thing. So I get a an, similar map, but then all every cell is basically a little square polygon uh, plotted. With with data of this size, you can do that when you have a couple of thousand cells. Uh, when you have like uh, a couple of million cells, you're not going to you're not going to do this, yeah. Unless you want to sort of uh, uh, burn down your your own computer. Um, quite often, raster data cubes have more than one layer, yeah. Where layer is kind of uh, a concept that uh, that comes a little bit from the raster package, and it's it's questionable whether what it really means, whether it means. Uh, um, uh, something in an, something in a dimension, or whether it means sort of different attributes, and, and the raster package is not very explicit about that. Uh, in any case, if we read things with restarts, if we read, for instance, a JPEG image, then we all know that JPEG images are are image or the, the, the standard thing are basically color images that contain three layers, an R G and a B, and we get that here. It's called Ben. Uh, and we see that we have three different bands and we can plot them. So we plot this three, uh, this uh, 200 by 175 by three data cube, and we get then three images of the last three bands. Yeah, so we get the, the X, Y uh, rasters for all of the three bands. So you see here the, the red, the green, and the blue uh, intensities were not surprisingly, they pretty much run from zero to 255. So this is byte data. Uh, and you can then, for instance, you can um, compute color values from these RGBs with a uh, command strgb. We discovered that 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 creates color values, uh, as you can see that here, uh, which is not for some reason it's it's not uh, plotted, it's not shown here, but we know the R logo. Um, uh, so this is a very inefficient way to handle this for larger data sets we just discovered. So if you have, you have us, uh, millions of pixels and you're going to do this with, trying to do this with, uh, with ggplot, then it, it's going to take a long, long time. So this is not an if, in a, a very efficient way, but anyway, it was an experiment. Um, um, we're trying, we learn, we're learning. Um, some more serious data. Here is a data set that comes with the package stars. That is a small subset of a Landsat 7 ETM uh, uh, satellite image that was collected uh, near Olina in Brazil, right? So we are not so far from, uh, relatively not so far from uh, Latin America, uh, from, from Middle America, from Monterey, as, uh, as I am. Uh, so we read this thing. So this just, it just calls the file name. We read this thing and we get then so it, it tells me, okay, you get a single attribute, but you get, and you get X and Y. So this is a 350 by 350 image and you get here six bands. Yeah, this is typical for remote sensing data that we have multiple bands. And these are the six bands that have 30 meter pixels. Yeah, so we see here uh, 30, nearly 30, nearly 30. Um, and we see that it's referenced in UTM zone 25 South. Um, and we see here that this is sort of, these are bands that are ordered in uh, wavelength. So it starts with the blue and then uh, the green and then the red, and then we get some near infrared, uh, middle infrared and, and so on uh, 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 bandwidths, right? And we get this, all these six bands here plotted and we get a common uh, color scale where the uh, color breaks are chosen as quantiles uh, over these six bands, yeah? So we get a maximum stretch. Basically every color is seen over these six uh, images is kind of has a similar uh, similar area that you get. It, you, can, you can compare this a little bit to a uh, high dynamical range, what you do with, uh, with, with digital cameras or even with phones today have these kind of things. So it, it kind of 
it kind of increases, it, it maximizes the contrast uh, we see in, in, in the image or the, the signal uh, compared to if you would, if you would use an equal color scale. So we saw an equal color scale, for instance, here, right? This is, these are equal color breaks uh, that, that was set and that is easy like this. You say breaks is equal and you get equal colors, color breaks, right? If we don't say anything, you get quantile color breaks. Uh, we can also do this without joining the, 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 the Z limit, so the joining the, the color values. Uh, we can say don't join them, and for each of the uh, sub-images, kind of make this make this histogram stretching, as it is called in, in remote sensing, uh, and we see even more per color. We see more, but we can't see which uh, which image which which image has more has higher intensities or lower intensities. That that goes that is lost now. We can then also do RGB composites. This is the red, green, blue. So this is this is uh, true color, as we say, and this is false color from 432. That kind of uh, indicates is used often because by red we see then when the where the green areas are. So the red in false color images typically tells you where things are uh, vegetated. Uh, easier than than RGB composites. Yeah, so we, we can do this, these uh, color composites uh, easily. Um, transforming and warping rasters. Yeah, that is another topic. Rasters are, you know, are regular, but quite often they have to be uh, combined with other data. And, and that other data might be in a different reference system or might be another raster that, that actually doesn't line up with the raster that you have because it was a raster in let it get longitude and not in UTM or something like that, right? So that is that we that something that we're looking now on. We're taking a bounding box here over uh, over Europe, uh, computed in WGS84, so in in uh, geographical coordinates, uh, as you can see here, and spans a certain region, and then we uh, basically uh, create a regular grid with uh, cell size of one one degree. Does it in, does it mean? Um, um, and and that that is kind of that kind of covers Europe or part of Europe, and then I looked at uh, data from the natural our natural Earth, that's a natural Earth data set, uh, and took the natural Earth countries and uh, selected one uh, value, the populate estimated population uh, for uh, for a certain country, and I divided that by the uh, by the area of the country, uh, and I. Rescaled that to have density one over squared one per squared kilometer, so we get reasonable sort of nicer values than the, the default is one per square meter, which is which is very low. Uh, and then I plot this this population density map uh, over sort of over the original data. So we here in the background we see uh, the the natural Earth data set as it was, and here you can see that I plotted sort of the the, the grid that I just created, I plotted on top of that. And you see some kind of connections that these colors sort of continue here, right? So this is really a rasterization uh, of, uh, as you can see here, a rasterization of my natural earth uh, data set, where I take the, take the population densities uh, out of the polygons and I assign them to, uh, to, uh, to the raster cells. Here we also see that the raster cells uh, are not square, they are Essentially, they are square in the sense that they uh, are one degree by one degree. But the plotting routine uh, takes sort of takes a scaling such that we get one kilometer north equals one kilometer west in the center of the of the area, which means that the the, the raster cells are not square anymore, right? Because one degree uh, latitude uh, varies very much uh, depending whether you're on the equator or whether you're closer to the poles. One degree longitude is always like 111 kilometer. So here we took that aspect ratio so that it is scaled through in the center of the center of the map. That is a default that uh, that this plot uh, routine actually takes. And if we then add something, then it's just it, it uses the same plotting parameters. Um, right. So what I did now is uh, I was going to transform these data to uh, another coordinate reference system. This is in basically in uh, what we call equirecting, equi, oh, how is this called? It's, it's the, basically the, 
projection where you just say, well, this is latitude, this is longitude, and I'm, I'm scaling them in a simple way with an, with an aspect ratio. Um, equirectangular, equirectangular, I think it's called, right? So it is the, the plot carré, the, the two squares of the Earth when you do it for the globe. I'm now going to transform that into uh, a Lombard, Lombard equal area projection, yeah? So that has the equal area uh, property, yeah? That, that is often used uh, so that countries sort of, it, it deforms things, but countries sort of are relative to each other, have sort of uh, realistic sizes, yeah? So that the size of countries corresponds to their, uh, to their uh, area size. And that is often used for political maps. So I'm transforming this uh, this grid here now. This is the the grid, the the population grid that for, that are rasterized from the natural Earth vector data set. So this this grid, and if I do that and I plot it in this new uh, in this new uh, coordinates, you see that it looks like this. Yeah. So it doesn't look anymore like a regular raster, right? Because our rasters are not anymore lined up horizontally and vertically. No. Well, in, in, you know, somewhere they are but most of the areas, they are not. They are kind of skewed and their directions differ. Yeah, so this is what, uh, what ST transform does with a raster. If you just say, move it somewhere else, then it doesn't recompute grid cells. It doesn't say I'm going to recompute a raster in a new coordinate reference system. No, it's just going to say, okay, this is regular. Right now, it is no longer regular. It's what I call curvilinear, right? And curvilinear grids, have essentially uh, x and y coordinates re registered for every raster cell, right? For every raster cell center, and I'm going to compute kind of local uh, little squares around them to uh, to plot them. So this is now transformed, but none of the raster cell values have been changed by this transformation. Yeah? So these cell values are still identical to what they were, um, and that is. Uh, that is something that you can do. So that is also a type of a raster, but that is not the type of raster that you can do with a raster package or that you uh, typically get. But sometimes you actually have to download data that come in this curvilinear for, form. Actually, a lot of a lot of modeling data comes like this. The raw Sentinel 5P air quality uh, data comes like curvilinear grids um, and so on. Yeah. So so you have this and you can handle this. And what you then can do is, if you want to sort of have this in a in a regular sort of grid in these new coordinate reference systems in the Lambert equal area coordinate reference system, you can use uh, st underscore warp to basically uh, warp this population grid, this curvilinear population grid, to a target grid which is uh, regular because STS stars from some bounding box in the new uh, coordinate reference system makes a regular grid. And then we warp things and we get them sort of warped uh, into this new grid. And here we can see the, the warped uh, values that are essentially in a regular grid. And right, you still see the blockiness. Yeah, so it is warping really sort of, uh, you, we warp from a very coarse grid into a much finer grid. We haven't, we haven't set the cell sizes here, but we basically have a 250 by 250 map here, where here we had a 30 by 20. Yeah, so we get sort of a factor 10 uh, increase of, uh, 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 of cell size densities. And that's why we see these, this blockiness still from the old uh, map that is burned in. I wouldn't say that this is a good, good way to do. Uh, I mean, it looks terrible, of course, but it's just to demonstrate that we have grids that we can transform that then becomes curvilinear grids. And then we can sort of burn them into new uh, grids by this ST warp thing. Now this is all about uh, rasters and coordinate reference systems and, and moved rasters and so on. Uh, what we also have is uh, uh, raster data cubes where we have time and multiple attributes. Yeah, so multiple attributes. Here is a uh, little NetCDF data set that also comes with the stars package that we're now going to read in. Uh, that gives you two variables, the PR and the TAS. I think that PR stands for precipitation and TAS stands for temperature above surface or something like that. They come with measurement units because they're NetCDF files and the NetCDF people uh, believe that it's useful that if you, if you sort of communicate a variable to somebody else that you tell in which measurement units 
uh, that was held and we're reading that and we're passing that on and we're propagating these measurement units. We're trying to do that. Uh, this is wrong. This has to be degrees Celsius, yeah, but it says C. So a lot of measurement units are, that you find are actually wrong. This is a rather small grid uh, of 81 columns, 33 rows and 12 time instances. Here you can see that the time instance are post CT and you can see that they run uh, over the whole year of uh, 1999. It seems, yeah. And uh, here we can plot this thing, and then we get basically plotted the first uh, attribute. So it will ignore the second attribute for now. It just plots the first attribute and gives a time series of that. And again, uses these quantiles to kind of stretch the colors over the 12 different uh, instances. Yeah, so this gives a quick overview of time variability. I could here also select the second attribute to plot the second attribute. The, the temperature instead of the precipitation. Um, another case that we load here is a data set that is uh, read from the STARS data. So, uh, you know, if you have large example data and you put that in your package and you submit it to CRON, then uh, within no time you get a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, comments from the, from the extremely good CRON people and saying, hey, listen, your package is large enough, five megabyte bring it down to under five megabytes, right? And then, you know, you do a lot of talking, it doesn't work. Yeah, so, yeah, so that is why I have this, this package just to, to throw a little bit larger data and, and try things out with them. This is actually AVHRR. So that is, uh, I think that is in a, a measurement device run by NOAA or something like that. Uh, and that is distributed um, globally um, and, daily yeah so uh, so i think it is noah that creates daily data sets here are nine instances for nine days uh, downloaded and uh, basically they put every day they put a new net cdf file so if you want to download these data you end up with having daily net cdf files and you have to comp you have to put them together right so i'm here just making this uh, making this file list which is a concatenation of the file names and the directory name uh, and I'm going to read this and read this file list and what read stars then tries to figure out is aha it says I have all these files have the same attributes uh, they all have units which are again wrong there is a star that shouldn't be there um, and um, you can see that it's a four-dimensional data cube and that by reading this we have now um, merged these nine uh, files into a single dimension that is the time dimension and we have nine instances and uh, they're running over uh, basically uh, with the delta of one day and they're in POSIX CT. So they're they are they read and they're basically joined over their time dimension because it's a common thing that you have uh, that you have sort of um, time variability over different files. The alternative would be that NOAA would sort of rewrite this same netcdf file with the entire array but then the file gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you you're never going to download the file that's so big and you're also never going to 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 um to 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 write it properly in, in a real, realistic time yeah so this is a way of, of of increasing data sets you also see that there's a z level which is the elevation of these observations and that is zero meters so that means c level uh, and it's it's an obsolete dimension because we don't have variability. It goes from one to one, uh, and and so this is a four-dimensional data cube. But the third dimension has only cardinality one, yeah, so that doesn't help much. Uh, we can drop that with a drop, which basically is a drop works on arrays two, which throws out sort of obsolete dimensions, and then we see that we get rid of it. Yeah, we also got rid of the information that this was taken at zero level. Uh, but that is that is okay because we just want to plot these time series of these nine things, and we do this plot with uh, ggplot2 just as a demonstration. And ggplot2 uses geom stars, and geom stars is just a thin wrapper about uh, geom raster, I think. Um, so that doesn't do much. What it does do is downsampling the data, so to get sort of real, really sort of relatively quick uh, data. We want to downsample this with a factor two because we have here 1400 by 720 pixels in a single image. 
we're going to plot nine images of those, right? If I was going to plot my full screen, this would be useful to, to, be, to work as a resolution here. But if I do it in a small part of my screen, as you see here, and then I have seven, uh, nine submaps, then you can see I get these submaps, which are basically, well, what would it be? Like uh, maybe 300, you know, 200 pixels by 400 pixels or something like that. This is what we see. Yeah? So I'm going to downsample here uh, pretty heavily. Uh, and basically make a ggplot of a reduced data set uh, of a lower resolution uh, that you can see here, but you don't see it really that this is at a lower resolution. It is still fine because you see the patterns. And otherwise you would plot all the pixels and they would just sort of take a long time, but not give you more information than pixels you can see on your screen. So there was a bit of an optimization that I did, that I did here is the, is the downsampling. Um, other options, other operations that you could do on data cubes is the, is the subsetting. Uh, we can do that by the square bracket, for instance, in, and the first square bracket basically uh, takes, uh, takes the attributes, right? So we here select the second attribute. We have uh, these four attributes, so like sea surface temperature, anomaly, uh, error, and ice coverage percentage. Uh, and we take the second one here, yeah? This is, the stars object is a very simple uh, object. It's basically a list with arrays and then an attribute that has a dimension table in it. Yeah, so it's, it's very transparent in, in seeing how it works. And this basically takes the second list element, but uh, keeps the dimension because that doesn't change. Right? So we have a single array now. We can also uh, use the second, uh, uh, the second and the third um, sort of, um, aspects of the square bracket selector and that selects x values and y values right so we have here 10 rows selected and we have 12 oh, sorry 10 columns selected and 12 rows uh, selected um, right and we can also take one uh, elevation which we already had or we can take three time instances time three to five and we see that we have only three uh, the three to five time instances yeah the offset uh, the offset doesn't uh, doesn't change. Um, right. Uh, another way is to um, I don't know why this is not plotted. Another way is if you have a global one degree grid is to sort of subset uh, the values that correspond to some kind of uh, some kind of geometry, which is sort of uh, given here. So you get uh, basically it 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 sets the, all values to NA that are not sort of uh, course that are not intersecting with this uh, natural earth geometry. Yeah, so that is another way. Uh, cropping can be done. You can crop areas means that you that you make make them uh, smaller and 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 things outside of a mask are getting NA. Uh, there's a couple of tidy verbs that you can use. Uh, slice and filter are both for uh, for dimension value for slice. Uh, uses their index, the, just as that they did here. This is also slicing, uh, and filter looks at uh, dimension values. So you would give coordinates or dates in the filter argument. Uh, pull pulls out an attribute, select, select one or more variables and might create new ones, mutate to create new ones. There is an aggregate and an uh, extract value. So aggregate can aggregate over areas or over time periods. Uh, and extract extracts um, data cube values at, at point locations. There is ways you can go from raster to vector and vector to raster. So rasterize, uh, as we did above, uh, rasterizes values and SDS2F uh, uh, vectorizes them. Yeah? So you can either, as, and we have also done that, but it can also merge uh, uh, raster cells that have sort of the same attribute value into sort of polygons that, that, that include more than one raster cell. Um, the final thing that I wanted to, um, that I wanted to, to put out uh, to, to sort of uh, make you aware of is that is the idea of proxy objects and lazy reading and lazy computing. Um, and that is sort of caused me a lot of headaches how to do that. The thing is that with image data, uh, pretty soon you end up with looking at amounts of data that no longer sort of uh, that that would no longer fit in in your main memory of your computer, yeah. And even they might not fit on your hard drive, yeah. So if you would look at 
um, all the Sentinel-2 satellite imagery collected over Mexico over the last uh, four years, then you have, you're, you're talking about data sets that probably don't, won't fit on, on, on the hard drive you have. Yeah? So, so that is a problem. And even one of these tiles, so we have a tile here available in the STARS data package, is something that you have, you, knew, you need to have a beefy laptop to sort of load this whole thing in your, uh, in, your, um, in your main memory. And loading things in main memory is what R tries to do if you don't tell it differently, right? Um, so R is not, you know, hasn't been written to, to sort of officially use your, your hard drive as a buffer when things don't fit in memory. No, it will try to read things in memory. So we had to, to move around that and basically make things uh, workable for larger, uh, for larger raster files, uh, just like the raster package also does that for you. Uh, but uh, here we took a very uh, different approach, basically by, uh, by using proxy objects and, uh, and lazy evaluation. Right, so here I'm going to uh, define uh, a data set that has a very long name, if you, if you look, would look at the data set. Uh, and that, that is because, uh, because a lot of metadata is typically encoded in, in file names for, uh, for uh, satellite imagery, which is absolutely, absolutely absurd, but, but people do that, right? Uh, anyway, with this long file name here um, collected with, uh, with sort of, it tells here, it tells which driver it is, that it's a zip file, where it is comes from here, and then what the, what the tile name is, is basically this one, and then it says, you need to read this little thing uh, to find out what, what, what means what, what is what in this zip file. So it's, it's going to read this. This is not, you know, very little what starts this is really GDAL, what GDAL does. Uh, but it's not going to read this whole thing. It says, no, I give you back a stars proxy object um, with, uh, with one attribute and it's held in this file. It doesn't even show the full file name because it is way too long, uh, but it reads the dimension table, right? And you see here, this is an 11K by 11K image, right? So you need kind of, you need, uh, I, if I wanted to look at this entire image, I need it hundred screens here in my room just to see every pixel and a pixel of my screen, right? This is kind of the detail it has. This is 10 meter resolution, uh, which is very high, but also a very large data set. That's hundred million pixels. And then it has four bands. This is the, ten, the four 10 meter bands. Sentinel-2 has like 15 bands, but there are only five, uh, four of them are at 10 meter resolution. And they are in UTM zone 23. This is an area nearby that I selected. Um, and now I want to sort of look at these data and you can see the bands have names, band four, five, six, and eight, I think. Uh, and what I want to do is now look at NDVI values. NDVI is the vegetation index, which looks at a uh, normalized difference uh, uh, vegetation index, which, which divides the difference over the sum, this is a normalization, of near infrared and, uh, sorry, near infrared and red. And by that, it gives you a good indicator for how much vegetation somewhere is. So I'm going to apply this. And when I apply this to this data set, this proxy data set, which is here called P, yeah, uh, and I say, do this for all pixels, meaning do this over the band dimension, yeah, because they are here are the, the red band and the near infrared band. Um, do this for every band. So, so, so do this for every pixel over the band, it gives me a new data set back that has done nothing because you see, you, you would expect that the band dimension would have been reduced. It has done nothing. It has just sort of glued the homework that is still to do uh, to the object, right? So this is, uh, this, is, this is really cheating. It says, well, you know, you just want an object that can do this, but it doesn't actually do this. If it would do this, it would take 10 minutes yes, to do that and then to compute it, and then probably 10 minutes to write this to, to your hard drive. This takes like, uh, you know, a fraction of a second because it doesn't do anything. It just sort of says, okay, this is what I have to do. If I then plot it like here, this takes, I don't know, but it takes a few seconds or something like that. If, I don't know if anyone of you tried this, but what it, do, what it does, uh, when, when I ask, ask the software to plot this, then it says, okay, it, I have a data set, uh, I have something to do. And then 
it says, uh, how many pixels do I have? Well, this is my plotting region. Uh, so this is like 500 by 500 pixels. Okay, um, how many pixels do I have? Hmm, 11,000 by 11,000. So I cannot plot all of them, right? So what it then does, it says, well, let's look at what we are going to do. We have an ST apply that runs on a certain margin. Well, if this margin concerns, you know, includes my X and Y coordinates, then I'm going to do something only on this band dimension. So whatever I do for one pixel or a next pixel, it's not going, one thing is not going to affect the other. This is just running on the band dimension. So I can compute all these 11,000 by 11,000, 100 million pixels, but then I'm going to throw them all away and just plot these 300 by 300 because that is all you can see. Yeah, so that's all that's going to be plotted. So what it does, it really reorders the thing. It sort of analyzes the homework. Uh, then it says, okay, I um, have a plot stars proxy. I'm going to look at, uh, is this pixel wise? Yes, then I can do it if more efficient. I can read pixels at screen resolution, then apply this NDVI, meaning 300 by 300. Then I can apply this NDVI function to all these pixels. And then I can compute NDVI for the pixels read, and then I plot them. Yeah? And instead of taking 10 minutes, what it would take to do this plot for the entire data set, it will do this in a matter of seconds, essentially, because it doesn't have to go through the whole data set, but takes a, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, overviews, so lower resolution uh, sort of pyramid representations of this, which works much, much faster. Yeah? So this is a pattern that anyone who's ever worked with Google Earth Engine also does. So you, you have the feeling that you work with a full data set, but Google Earth Engine knows that you're only looking at a little part of your screen and you have so many pixels and it's going to compute the pixel values that you can see. And then if you zoom in, it recomputes and redoes that for the zoomed in area. Yeah, so you can see it while, while it does that with, with building up the tiles and so on. Uh, now we can we cannot zoom in into our plots, but we are actually working together with with Tim Apple Hans on the in in the MapView package to to make that same pattern uh, work, uh, basically by when when the recomputing then happens in the in the browser, so that if you do something that it only does it for the screen resolution, if you zoom in that it redoes it for the for the zoomed resolution. Yeah? If you have certain functions like like in DVI band indexes. Um, so that brings me to the end of uh, to the end of this of to the end of this presentation. Uh, if there are certain things that uh, anyone wants me to to try out with this data or something like that, or if you want to try things out yourself and you have questions uh, or or get stuck or things don't work or unexpected or something like that, then don't hesitate to uh, to contact me to contact us either on the RCGU mailing list or on, as a GitHub issue or. You know, you can you can try you can try direct email. I usually answer them. You know, try to make this some kind of thing where other people in the community also could benefit from the answer, or other people could also look at whether they have answers. So that not every not all the questions come to me because that doesn't scale up very well. Uh, but please don't hesitate in in getting involved in uh, in um, in discussing uh, you know the development of the software and the the properties it has and the documentation and these kind of things. Um, that was actually all I wanted to uh, to present to you about um, about the uh, analysis of uh, about what's what what data cubes actually are. How do you relate to vector and uh, raster data? Um, the way we can analyze them and a number of very sort of uh, simple, uh, but you know, um, sort of. Uh, very simple and effect, somewhat somewhat effective, but rather primitive uh, visualizations that I've been uh, that I've been working on. Um, and uh, that was my. I can see that there's there's a chat. Um, um, there's a couple of couple of questions in the chat. I can see. Yeah, yeah. that's so it. One from me. Adrian Calleros. If I wanted to. Am I able to run something like zonal statistics? Like zonal statistics? Um, yeah, you can do that. Zonal statistics is the um, is where you compute. Um, it, it's a raster operation. 
it's it is the raster operation where you want to compute um, properties of a set of raster cells in a certain area where the area is given. Yeah, so it really it's a, it's basically what I call going from raster to vector. Right, you want from a raster image or a raster stack or a raster data cube, you want for each of a set of regions you want to get some summary. For instance, the mean or the maximum. And that is in uh, the stars package that is, is available in, in the command um, aggregate. Yeah, so there's an aggregate command uh, where you could, let me just, uh, let me just sort of uh, share my screen. Um, here is um, stars. Um, there's an aggregate stars that specially aggregates uh, stars, spatially or temporally aggregate stars object. So you throw in an, uh, a stars object and you throw in a set of polygons and you say, what kind of function do I need to apply to summarize the raster cells under the polygon for each of the polygons? Yeah, so it returns an object that has a data cube that has instead of the raster dimensions has now a simple feature, it has a polygon dimension and the rest stays the same. So if it's a temporal cube, it's still a temporal cube and, uh, and does that. Yeah? So here are a set of examples. Um, this is an example where, um, oh, it gives, it gives some, some warnings here, but um, it is an example where I basically did one, uh, accumulated uh, precipitation over over an area you know, where the input data set was I think was these um, the input data set was I think a set of um, a set of well let me just try this. Uh, now I'm moving to, oh, hang on, I have to uh, move now to the, so we're going now, this is going to get embarrassed to see my primitive abilities in our studio. So I just did this and I read this, uh, this precipitation file. So we have this precipitation data cube, which is, uh, hey. I hate auto completion. Um, so, it, so this is a, a vector data cube that you, is now appearing here. Uh, it's a time series of curvilinear grids uh, with the precipitations. Um, I think it is much easier if I show you this because it is also on the. Uh, um, this is also on the. Um, I think this is also on the starting page of the stars package. So you can see that here, um, you see here the same time series that I was just trying to plot uh, with curvilinear grids over North Carolina. And that is basically here burned in into these uh, uh, county values with some, with some function that takes the maximum precipitation for each county. Uh, and I get a time series or a vector data cube and here it's aggregated over the time dimension uh, to get uh, to get actually the time of the maximum precipitation back. Yeah? So I I did kind of like which time uh, was the precipitation in this county was the maximum precipitation at its maximum. Yeah, because it's maximized over the raster cells in each county. Uh, so yes, that is a yes. So you can do uh, you can do that. Um, um, there's another uh, question about Kyoter. Mark Weaver. Uh, you ended with stars proxy objects and made comparison with Air Engine. Do you have any tips, thoughts on limits with size of data analysis with the stars? 
say in comparison to tools like Earth Engine? Yeah, so we are uh, we are looking at that, um, but not so. Yeah, say in comparison with tools like Earth Engine. So Earth Engine, uh, it has a data set that uh, I think last times I heard it was a couple of years back. Was it, it was in the order of like thirty petabyte or so, and so it's probably already doubled or quadrupled or whatever. So this is an astronomical size. If you think of that amount of data, you have to really think of uh you know of a building a building full with racks and hard drives uh, and something like that um so that is that is i mean that's the, the the amount of data that is relatively difficult to grasp how to how to handle that so uh those kind of data you can forget the whole idea of downloading right because you don't have drives here even if you had the drives available for doing that the network bandwidth it would take to download such amounts of data would be kind of would take possibly years to to do to get your data there. Yeah? So this is so these these are things that you can only realistically uh, do if a, in this, in a central place if a lot of people want to do that. So for instance, the Google Cloud, for instance, the Amazon Cloud has have these these large these complete data archives uh, and a number of other clouds uh, that are people are trying in Europe are also trying to to do this this is of course this is partly a pride thing um, we are looking at you know uh, because earth engine is a fantastic product the thing is that it is not open source so you don't know exactly what's going on the thing is that it's not extendable in the sense that you cannot run your own R script with your time series model on Google Earth engine data because it doesn't allow you to do that so if you wanted to do something like that but on the scale of, of data that's available in Google Earth Engine, you couldn't, and you would have to look at other um, at other approaches to doing that, and probably have work with clouds where you have more control over accessing and processing your data. Uh, we am I still sharing this thing? Yeah, we're we're running a project that's called OpenEO already for a while, where we are sort of slowly building, uh, let's say infrastructure infrastructure meaning compute backends a proper api for abstracting the functions and abstracting your data sets in the sense of working with uh, image collections and uh, an ecosystem of clients like notebooks python uh, r clients javascript quantum gis plugins and so on, and whole ecosystems of clients of using that uh, to do something that that probably uh, you know that that earth engine does does much better because you know because we 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 started only a couple of years ago and earth engine started you know 10 years ago and earth engine had a, a budget of let's say 20 times that of ours yeah so so there is and so we are working in that direction it is just that we haven't we haven't really finished that uh, but it's some certainly something that is worth uh, exploring um but um the yeah, so that is, and, and also in the context of stars, we are we are using uh, stars, for instance, to um, if you would if if you had to have an infrastructure like that where your big data archive is in the cloud, and you want to do your R functions uh, on them, and you want to do something spatial temporal, then you probably want to work with stars objects because they are very simple and comprehensive, uh, and 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 you could do that once some kind of the cloud infrastructure, the backend basically does the looping, does sort of goes through all, you know, creates all these little, uh, sh these smaller uh, data spatial temporal data cubes and, and sort of throws the stars infrastructure or whatever it is uh, to them. Yeah, and that would sort of give a lot of, uh, an enormous amount of flexibility that uh, Earth Engine uh, right now doesn't have. Yeah, it is, it is, Earth Engine is, I think, relatively poor. Uh, for time series analysis uh, compared to what you could do uh, with R in terms of time series analysis. I'm going to make a little bit of light here. Um, yeah, so, so I hope, yeah. Uh, I think we have a uh, last question uh, from Alexander Quevedo. That's if I'm interested in parallelizing a function, for example, the calculation of NDPI, what is the best strategy using the stars? Uh, I think that, I, I think I have to look at 
up, but um, it, I'm still sharing my screen, right? So, uh, right, so where were we? Uh, here. We, that, we, I did that with uh, ST apply. And ST apply, I think, um, has a couple of arguments that basically point you to using uh, using parallelized approaches to doing that because apply is sort of embarrassingly parallel and ST apply is that too. Uh, so it lets you sort of, if you pass it a cluster, then it will use parallel apply. If you say use future, then it will use future dot apply, call it on future underscore apply. So it has, it, it sort of, it connects to the obvious R ways of, of parallelizing things. Whether this will help much depends also a little bit on on the uh, uh, on the complexity of this function. Yeah. So if you have an expensive time series function that really takes some time to do something, then that will make sense to parallelize it this way. If you have something as trivial as NDVI, I'm I'm not sure how much that will bring because plus you know parallelization always. Uh, has a, a cost and a benefit, right? And uh, the more things are big and independent, um, the more the benefit is. But we quite often see that things are relatively small and independent. And then uh, you use suddenly 10 cores, but you also have to do a lot of overhead because there are all these tiny things that you're moving around all the time. So it's not, it's not like uh, these are simple implementations and that is, this might, work you know might give you an enormous benefit it also might might be sort of um, a surprisingly small benefit that you that you get so this is hard to to predict in advance how much this will this will bring you but but sort of simple approaches uh, are there definitely okay thank you so much so i just want to thank Edsir for your time your amazing presentation and all the materials that I that it is available on the links that I sent you guys uh, yesterday and this will finish the first part of this presentation and the second part will be presented by Martin uh, and so I let you with Martin okay hello everyone so uh, my name is Martijn. Yeah, it's Dutch. Yeah, we pronounced it Martijn, but Martin is also fine. Um, Sorry. So, um, yeah, so I work at Statistics Netherlands, uh, so the official statistical institute. So there we make um, like statistics from survey data, admin data, and also big data. And I work at the methods department, uh, also big data. And yeah, visualization, spatial data, all those kind of things. Um, so what I want to do, let me share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I want to go through uh, a couple of examples that, that Edsler showed. And go a little bit into more depth uh, on the visualization of them. And well, probably you know, but I have uh, written a package called TMAP. And I'll uh, use that, of course. Um, and TMAP is like a, a, pro, a project for like a couple of years. Um, like started from like basic uh, plotting functions and then expanding, expanding, expanding. And currently we're in a phase that, that uh, I released version 3.2, like just uh, Wednesday. And so there are two big things which will be uh, happening in like within the next year. So the first one is we are currently uh, writing a book on TMA. Finished, I think one chapter, one and a half chapter, but it's it's uh, it's like a side project next to my current job and all the other things I do. So it can take a while. And also, I'm thinking about uh, making it a little bit more generic. 
and going to like 4.0. Uh, but I'll, yeah, that's just future uh, things. Um, so I'll start with a very short introduction, Pmap, like, um, and use some, some spatial objects. And then I'll focus uh, on the, the, the stars objects and how you can visualize them with, with Pmap. So, okay. Um, yeah, so if you want to run this code yourself, uh, let, make sure you, you run uh, the latest version, so 3.2. It's the same version as the current GitHub version, but I didn't make any comments uh, mid uh, last two days. Uh, so there are some data sets that you can use uh, that are like within, within the team package. So there is, for instance, world, uh, country polygons, and also land. Uh, so yeah, well, I think I'll skip oh, yeah, and one metro. So let me focus on these three uh, the, uh, uh, objects. Um, so when you want to plot them, uh, so let me let me load SF and stars as well. So when we plot them, we can do plot world. And what you'll see is um, all the, the attributes, so all the columns in the data. So world is an SF object with, with all these columns and each uh, of these, these columns gets an OMAP. Uh, with PMAP, uh, when you do a quick plot, it's QTM, which stands for quick thematic map. Uh, by default, I don't show the, all the variables. I just plot the map as it is. Um, and you can um, do tab completion, you see shape of the world. So yeah, TMAP is like a vocabulary that I use. Uh, shape, SHP, I use for spatial objects in general. So it could be SF objects, cluster objects, stars objects. Um, and then you see all the aesthetics. So it's, if you're uh, familiar with ggplot, uh, then these are like the uh, uh, AES function, aesthetics. So for instance, if I fill and I use like a regular uh, so, yeah, so you just specify the, the variable names within uh, the quotes. And then you get like a core path of footprint. And that's like a way to show that. And if you want small multiples, so for instance, at the planet index 12, you do this. Um, and so I'll just, yeah, okay. So first I'll just introduce the, the spatial objects. So, Land is a stars object uh, with four attributes and like two dimensions, X and Y. So you can think about these, yeah, as, as layers. If, if you, I mean, if you uh, in TMAP two point something, I uh, was using roster, and then that that this was a roster brick, which contains all these four for different uh, layers. Uh, but I think really nice thing about stars is that you, just, like what Edson told, uh, you distinguish between attributes and dimensions. I mean, if you have time, it's typically a dimension. You can have time as attributes, uh, like 19, 20, 19, 30, 19, 40, et cetera. But it makes much more sense to do it as a dimension than to do it as a, as a time dimension. Whereas these things cover, as it's like uh, this is land cover, land cover class, trees cover, and elevation. They're like very sim very different things. So it makes much more sense to, to model them as, as attributes. 
Um, so if I do a QTM land, uh, then I get something that I'll explain later on. Uh, so what you already see is that it's downsampled. I think it's because I was working on small multiples uh, using a very large stars data. Um, and I changed the settings, uh, the down, down sample settings. Uh, I'll come back to that later. So, but there's like function key map options, uh, which is a list of, of all the yeah, all op options. Um, within TMAP and you can set them, you can reset them, so I just reset them. And if I rerun the same example, then it isn't down samples because uh, land, as you've seen, it's not very large, it's about 1,000, like 500 uh, pixels, and then four attributes. Mm. Oh yeah, so the other, Okay, so the other message that you've seen is, uh, I'm not sure this one should, should not be any, but anyways, uh, there is a, a elevation contains a positive and negative values. So therefore, uh, it's interpreted as a diverging color scheme. Uh, I think, yeah, I'll, call, I'll come back to that later. Uh, okay, so so just returning to to what the focus is right now is like to show you all the spatial objects. And so and for so for polygons, the default is just to show the polygons in gray, and for for stars, the default is to show all the attributes. Or if there is one attribute and there is a third dimension, for instance, time, then to show small multiples for each time step. Uh, so the other data set is called Metro. It's uh, yeah, spatial points, metropolitan areas. It's uh, a yeah, very simple uh, SF object in cities. Uh, ISO 8 code of the country and population in this time, in this case. So this this data set can probably be turned to a, a stars, stars data set. Because it has like a time time, time, time dimension. Okay, so but for, for like theme, um yeah, so uh, before I'll uh, dive into the plotting mechanism itself, uh, there is there are two modes of so plot and view. So by default, it starts with plot mode, but you can change it to the PMAP mode view, and likewise plot. Uh, but I'm a lazy person myself, so I'll just invented this PTM. It isn't used anywhere else in, in our community, so I just decided to use that to toggle between the two modes. So if I do QTM world, I get an interactive map of the world. And if I do QTM land, then I get an interactive map of all the rosters. Uh, let me uh, switch to the browser. So there you see uh, a stars object. Uh, and this looks very fancy, but it's, uh, I didn't uh, do very hard work in implementing it. It's basically made possible by uh, leaflet, our leaflet and map view. So uh, big thanks to, to those guys. Um, so again, you can always uh, do PTM to switch back, and then, and then if it plots, then you get uh, this regular uh, static plot. And the same. So if I want to show the, the world cities metro, QTM metro, 
And it's very handy if you click on one uh, one unit, special unit, then you see all the variables. And by default, it's also, I think, here, that you also see the latitude and longitude. Because often, if you want interactive mapping, you often want, uh, want to see the coordinates. And you can also, if you run it without any, uh, then you just see a base map. You can use the layers as well. And there's this theme. So for instance, by default, it shows three base layers. And there is sort of the theme of options, base map, or base maps, sorry, base maps, which is a vector of those those uh, layers. So I can also set it as you do this. And if I now run QTM, then I see just that OpenStreetMap basically. Uh, okay, so um, one more thing about QTM, what you can do Something like this. So hopefully, I'm, yeah, I'm in the field mode. Um, oh, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, let me show, yeah, so the code uh, simultaneously. So I now stacked two uh, plots. So the first one is the star subject with land cover and tree cover elevation. And the second one are country polygons. I um, only showed the borders, so fill. So the field aesthetic uh, set to no. Uh, and that's of course very useful. And under the hood, um, it does transform or warp the objects that are in a different uh, map projection, different CRS. So in this case, uh, if I do SD CRS land, it's, uh, it's just uh, the, the WGS84. So plot array, basically. And if I do SD uh, CRS world, then you see a different projection, maybe with Eckert 4 projection. Why do I use the Eckert 4 projection? Uh, because as a statistician, yeah, as a statistician, um, uh, the equal area property is very important. So this map cor correctly shows that Australia is three times as large as Greenland, and not the other way around. If you use different CRSs in the same plot, what it does, it, it uses the CRS of the first object by default. And you can change it. I um, think I'll show this later on. Okay. Yeah, you can change it with QTM, but it's not recommended. Um, so, but by default, what it does, it just reprojects, transforms basically the polygons into W8GS84. Okay, so if I want to replicate the map for, uh, so QTM is very handy for like quick plots, uh, like like uh, the, the standard plot function that I said, that Ezra showed a couple of times, and then ggplot, there's a qplot, which is kind of similar -ish. Um, But the, the main plotting methods go like this, so we have to say world plus, Again, it's it's very similar-ish to, to ggplot. So I, I, why did I did it this way? Because I like that ggplot and those things I didn't like from uh, ggplot, we did it a little differently, a little better or better uh, in the sense that it works better for maps, I guess, I hope. And if not, let me know. So the um, polygons, uh, so this is like a basic 
core button app. And what you have, you have to specify uh, the shape object, that world, and then I specified polygons, no polygons. So if I leave it out, you see like gray polygons, the default color. Um, but if I enter this, specify this, this static variable, there's only one for the polygons, which is this fill, fill color. And you see a whole bunch of, if I also look at the documentation, uh, see a whole bunch of variables, which you can set for instance, so let me show you a couple of them, uh, style. So by default, it uses a pretty scale, but you can also use k-means clustering, which basically is a one-dimensional k-means, um, which creates, in this case, five groups such that each group has the same amount of uh, values in the data. Um, yeah, we can tweak uh, like this, so eight groups. Uh, so I should just show you just quickly the different, uh, different parameters. So palette, so blue scale. Mm. Um, all right, so in the end, so of course, if you want to join me with running this code, you're free to type it in yourself. If you're a little bit lazy like me, then you can wait until I share this co code. I'll just put it on my uh, my workshop repo. So that's... This one. Uh, uh, so this address. So I've created two um, two mar our markdown files that I'll show uh, later on, and I'll upload this script as well. Because what I often like to do in this kind of workshops is to show you uh, different things and. Every time is a little bit different, uh, so I can, yeah. So I'll just 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 upload this one. Uh, okay. So if I want to reproduce this map, then uh, I first have to do blue shape land. Plus the raster. Plus so one uh, side note. So for plotting uh, stars object. I use uh, yeah, raster images, so basically pixel images for rectangle, for regular uh, rasters. And for irregular, uh, I convert it under the hood to uh, an SF object. And if, yeah, okay, so first, let me. Yeah, so and then I'll just show the borders. So there's function borders, which just show the borders without fill. So they have the same map. In, um, yeah, so about the, the, the use projection. So in interactive maps, uh, the projection is always uh, the uh, WGS84, so the 4, 3, 2, 6 projection, um, simply because there are base maps available. Um, and it's possible currently to use other projections, projections interactively for polygons. However, for, for um, roster objects, stars objects, it's not possible yet. So I have to work for, work, wait for, uh, for leaflets to make it possible. And then I'll implement the team map, obviously. Uh, but if, you, if I go to, to static mode, um, 
then because the lens is the first uh, shape object, so this is the first layer, it takes the W8GS84 uh, projection. If I want to use the world projection, the, the Eckert 4 projection that I use for the world uh, shape object, then I can set S master is true. And then it automatically transforms the uh, raster object into uh, the as of the interpretation of, of uh, what's used here. I'm, by the way, not sure why, uh, why it's cropped. Can be a bug, can be, so I have to, have to look, uh, look into that. Uh, but everywhere else looks okay. It looks like, uh, yeah, the, the warping was successful, but not for the, uh, these areas. So apologies for that. Okay, so any questions so far? Um, I think there is no question. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, there's, there's on GitHub, um, I think the IO pages. Uh, so I have a few vignettes. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask me. But if, uh, preferably via the, the issue list, because I got a lot of emails and then those got lost. So when I, when I go to, to, to uh, stars, the data cubes, Oh, so, you can see. so within the workshop page, I've just rendered the, the, the R on D files to markdown files. So you can, if you click on uh, a vector underscore cubes dot ND, you see the, the markdown. I just uh, I show it into uh, to our studio. So the first thing that I will want to show is the installation. I saw the North Carolina example. So, okay, yeah. Um, the stars object with, uh, so with one attribute population, and one dimension that contains the polygons and the other dimension of potency years. And this was one of the things that I thought, okay, this, uh, this should be implemented in TMAP directly. So unfortunately it can, what you ideally you want to do like this, TM shape, uh, and then shape object plus TM polygons, population, TM facets. Uh, TM facets, it works the same way. Let me show it with uh, facets by this component. So this shows you the facets per continent, the HPR. So I ideally want similar function for this, function call for this. So the shape, polygon, population, and then facets by year. Uh, it will be implemented in the next, uh, next version, next non-minor version. Uh, workaround for now to show that is to convert into an SF object. So first I'll extract the years. Uh, so yeah, okay. Uh, maybe actually probably shows it, but you can. If so, the object is this one. If you want the values for one of these dimensions, there's this function: is st get dimension values. 
and all you have to do is specify the start object and the dimension. So the first dimension you get a geometry set, it's all the geometries. The second dimension is year, so you get the years. So if you uh, you can convert a start object into an SF object with STSSF. SF is the tool. SF, years, and the geometry column is called SFC. And there you can plot it as follows. Uh, so TM shape plus the space shape object. And then what, what do you want to pl plot? Polygons. Uh, the variable years, so this is the aesthetic for a fill. In this case, there are two, uh, two values in that, so you get the, yeah, two small multiples. Uh, with the title SIR. Um, yeah, I have to explain this maybe a bit. So there's this. Um, R doesn't know because I think it's, it's related to, to the discussion, uh, the distinction between attributes and dimensions. If you see this SF object, um, TMF or R doesn't know if these ones are, uh, can be, should be treated as, as attributes, which is totally different things, apples and oranges, or if they're like uh, values in one dimension, which is not the case. So by default, to be safe, I assume they're totally different things. So if you run just this, not the title. Uh, you get the legend for the title, and the legend calculated differently for each facet. Uh, so it takes the minimum maximum value, it determines what kind of color scale should be used, in this case sequential color scale. Uh, but you see that the values are different. So here the, uh, the maximum value is below 3.5 and here it is above 4. So be, because we want to compare these, these images, you want to set three plot scales as false. And if you do this, so just these two lines, you're almost there, but then you don't have panel titles, you have to assign panel labels here. So that's it. Okay, All right, so about the color palettes. So by default, it uses uh, color palettes from Color Brewer. Uh, there is there are a couple of packages that facilitate uh, nice color palettes. Uh, so team of tools, it's like a package that contains all kind of yeah, handy functions. I think the handiest of all is Palette Explorer. Is I used a lot. Um, it's similar to, to the one that's included in uh, this, this little file for Windows. Mm, it's just similar to, uh, to the one that Color Brewer has, but then it's interactive. For example, I need, I need shine. So what you see is uh, the Brewer sequential palettes, Brewer categorical palettes, Brewer diverging palettes, uh, and there it is. It is also uh, widely used, I think, for MATLAB. Um, also a couple of sequential palettes. 
And so in sequential, you use for, um, yeah, like a value range that's either positive or negative. Diverging, you typically use for values can be positive or negative. Or what as it showed, if you want, uh, values uh, below one and above one. If one is a certain midpoint, then you can use a midpoint to be this color and map the values that are less than one on this side and greater than one on this side. Uh, what's so you can set the, uh, the number of colors that you want to have. What you also can do is you can simulate color blindness. So there are, I'm not an expert in what the medical aspect means, but there's like this, these, uh, the, I think this is the most common one. Red, green distinction. Can make it then you see that how people with color blindness perceive colors and the uh, bold printed names are the ones that should be um, should be okay. And I said, yes, preferred to use uh, these ones. And Oh, yeah, it's also the color, the code generator. So you can use this uh, function to, to get the colors. You can also uh, get them by using our color brewer package. Uh, there's also the, the library pals. There are a couple, so anyways, a couple of ways in how to achieve, how to get those, uh, those color palettes. So PELS is one package that also contains these all these uh, these, uh, these colors. And probably if you do color brewer, but greens, not really much to specify the number, so it then you get colors. And it's yeah, so it has many uh, many colors. And all. I think on the internet there are ways how to show all these. Uh, all these palettes. Um, but for, for team map, uh, I've let's see how much I will cost. You can so for team map you can just enter the name of the palette. All these palettes are, are uh, embedded and the number of colors. So in this case One palette, number of colors, and it's then you get like 10 color classes of purples. All right, and then thing actually do a minus sign, take it to reverse palette. Just for small handy to Okay, um, questions so far? No, I don't okay. see anyone. So anyone have a question? Okay, no. Okay, then I'll continue. Okay, um, so this one, so Russell cubes. So the Landsat 7 image, it's the LC This so plot L7 as this one with uh, six bands uh, sorted by wavelength. As we told. If I was show, want to show it in PMAP, then I can use PM shape plus PM raster. And again, you get uh, you have all these options. So palettes is. Uh, magma from the uh, uh, Pyridis package. And so, yeah, so again, by default, uh, because I didn't specify any aesthetic, and 
L7 is a star subject with one attribute and a third dimension. It shows uh, by default the, uh, all the, the, uh, the bands in small multiples, like the normal multiples. Uh, what I noticed is that most values are between uh, 50 and 100. So we want to improve the contrast a little bit. So what you can do with, with uh, style, so again, so these are uh, pretty. Yeah, I call this pretty. It's, uh, I think it's also called by, uh, by the underlying. So if I do pretty uh, zero or 200. So this was the choose on reboot uh, and a second. So these are the color classes. But if you want to use k-means, then you just have to enter style is k-means. And they already see much more contrast. Yeah, so this was the old one, this is the new one. Um, it's also TM raster. It plots values as if they were data. If you want to, uh, to let TMF know that it's actually re, uh, red, green, blue bands, then you say TM RGB. And then you get like that. Uh, realistic colors. But again, the, it's too dark because the, the values are between 50 and 100, whereas the maximum value is 245. Uh, you can also see it with the histogram. So again, uh, L7 star subject, L7 the first attribute. Uh, then you get the data values. So uh, again, it's an array, uh, array three-dimensional array. Um, and if you make an histogram of it, so you flatten it to one, one single vector, make an histogram of it, you see uh, almost normal Gaussian distribution with one peak here. Um, so what I did is, um, so because our TM RGB, it plots the data as is, and you can only set a maximum value. Um, still, I think there was there was a feature request to do that more with uh, specify dynamics, but I'm not. Yeah, don't know how yet. I have to look dive into that. But for this one, I um, I just truncated the values between twenty five and 125. So basically what I did is um, uh, as the apply on the third dimension, so per band, I just have PD max with the other very other value being 25. So P max 125, it gives me uh, um, a truncated value so the value is at least 25. And I did the same for the min, 150. So I may I just uh, change all these values to, to 125, or to 150 in this case. Uh, not to 150, sorry. Uh, so yeah, it goes from 25 to 150. And then I uh, subtracted 25. So I shifted this range to 0, 1, 25. And if I show it now, then, oh yeah, then it's, uh, let's see, this and then we compare. Oh, this, sorry, we moved the wrong plot. So this was the, uh, 
the new image and this is the old image. Oh yeah, by the way, if you have these two images, so I know I'm not correcting myself. Um, there is this function, let me write it in the in markdown. If you want to, uh, to show two plots next to each other, other than like small multiples, because these are different, diff they're just different plots. They can wrap them around in TMF range. With the first item be this object, second item this object. Yeah, so now you have to, to, uh, to image next to each other. So this one is the old one, and this one is the one with the uh, uh, set minimum and maximum. And it's also possible to see the false color image, also the one that I just showed. Uh, so now, so the, the, this is red, green, blue. Four, three, two, then infrared, red, green. And this is, yeah, often used for uh, Earth observation data to, sh to, to show a little bit better the differences between the land uses. So when we look at uh, when we look at weather data, so there's this one precipitation and temperature, the average temperature, Celsius. Then you see it's two attributes, uh, three dimensions, so for x, y, and time. Yeah, so this just goes to the more and better. And if I map it with uh, with TMAP, so yeah, here's a little bit uh, description about each of the pellets in the show that I uh, already explained. Uh, but to apply it here, so I just show one attribute, so the precipitation. So if I oh yeah, so if I use uh, double brackets, I get the values, so the, the array. And if I use one pair of records, then I get the stars object with only that attribute. I think there should be uh, like deep line uh, methods like slice as well, filter and that kind of things. Um, but I can't use this one. Okay, so if I want to show it, then I have to specify the shape, specify the roster, the title, because if yeah, so if I don't do it, then you get, yeah, then you see it's probably PR. PR. Um, specify the palette and the style. So in this case, don't continuous. And I plot the uh, North Carolina borders. So you can also do it interactively. So again, TTM, local thematic map, into view mode, and rerun this code. Yeah, then you see small multiples of all the presentation. It's kind of annoying that the legend is there and you cannot take it away. Uh, you can, just to show you disable the legend. Legend dot show, set to false. Okay. Um, 
still kind of see oh wait a second I kind of see the title or some titles but a little bit annoying uh, I have to look into that um, so what you can do is Original map. Okay, yeah, I draw. Okay, so the original map show panels, panel labels, and somehow they got lost in the interactive map. So I have to, uh, have to look into that. Uh, but anyway, if you should look at the static map, you see that in uh, September, there was a lot of vegetation. So again, so the, the, yeah, with style. Um, yeah, so if you use K means that I used earlier, the, the advantage of discrete color palettes is that you can read the, the values from the map. So you can say, okay, this is this is that kind of blue, this is middle blue, dark blue maybe here. Uh, but the disadvantage is that you so I can't see the how fluid the dis how smooth the distribution is. And so if you use the continuous color scale, then you really see how um, yeah how the value varies within uh, yeah geospatially. Okay, so for temperature, I use the from the PELS package, the full well, basically, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, rainbow package, balance, but the 10 colors. And I use it because color blue is to be associated with cold and orange to red to very hot. And so the midpoint, so green, I have set the midpoint to 10. So 10 degrees is Yeah, when, when it's from 10 degrees, it's really nice to cycle. So, uh, that's like the, the, the distinction between whether it's cold weather or not so cold weather, at least in the Netherlands. Um, oh, sorry, uh, 15, 15. Uh, and it's the number of uh, colors, 15, so, so 10, 15, 15 is apparently green. Um, yeah, so that's it. so the, uh, yeah, so so yeah, so can uh, TM shape. So this is the first uh, shape object, stars object. The layer is uh, Russell layer. The second shape object are North Carolina uh, borders, the polygons which show with borders. You can also do this, uh, it doesn't make sense, but just to show you that you can have multiple layers per shape object. And I see a dot in the center of each polygon. Which could, for in this case, it's not very useful, but where it is useful, uh, think of it, is the, does that have a name? Uh, this shape object only has, uh, Tips, tips is, I think, uh, an uh, identifier. So what I can do is the um, labels, the index, sorry, the index, and then the name of the variable. Okay, now it's uh, included with names. If you see this one exactly, Then you see the labels as well. But it's, it's, it's kind of slow because there are, I'm not sure how many, uh, hundreds uh, polygons, hundreds times the number of uh, small multiple uh, objects in total. But at least you can read the, the fifth.
questions so far? Mm, if no. not, okay. If not, I can think. Um, so the last uh, part of my uh, talk uh, will be about uh, large data, projecting data, that kind of things. So if I look at the large Sentinel-2 data from the STARS data package. So this one, it's uh, 10,000 or 10,000 uh, cells and four bands. So as Ed told, this is one of the STARS proxy object. So it's not stored into memory and only when, when, when you use it, Then, uh, then the data are retrieved, used, and often also don't send it. So if I take the UTM two, I think I'm still in interactive mode. So let's see how far how fast it goes. Okay, there we go. So four bands. Uh, we zoom out. You can see. It's part of the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, and you can always uh, deselect uh, this, this image. Um, static mode, it looks like this. Eight bands, and then again the channel names. I have to uh, make them work in uh, the interactive mode again. Also, again, yeah, QTM is handy for really quick, quick mapping, and it also has a title. Yeah, yeah, this is the main title. So you can have multiple legend blocks. Have to do rest. Anyway, so um, I will show, just show you the, the main blocking method. So there's a, a, an attribute in TM shape of whether to not downsample the rest object. If you don't, Okay, I'm not sure why this doesn't downsample, or why this does still does downsample. This object. Mm, not sure. It's just, okay. uh, but it's not recommended because it's very slow, and the number of pixels on your screen is limited anyway. I mean, now I use a full uh, HD screen. Now they're downsized by 1,000 by 1,000. Um, I think the number of pixels is maybe 200 by 200. So we cannot see uh, at a higher resolution of 200 by 200. And unless, of course, you print it in a high um, DPI. Yeah, so for this image, um, oh, this is the RGB plot, which now I set the max value to 14,000. Thinking of lights. Um, yeah, so. Uh, for the uh, the downsampling, there is this screen map option. Options. Max raster, sorry, um, max raster. 
it's uh, named uh, vector two values view and plot, plot a view, which correspond to the mode. Both are set to, to, one, to one million. Uh, one million means 1,000 by 1,000. If you do small multiples, which I can show here, this is also an example that I can show it. Show it, then it's down sampled. So by default, by one million, by one million, but it because the, apparently the number of um, x values larger than the number of y values, it takes into account uh, the, this, this aspect ratio, basically. And now the DAO sampling is, by the way, not very useful because uh, the original data is very close to these values, as you can see. Mm, but it's still kind of slow, as you plot it, so it takes takes a few seconds. If you do this, so max raster is uh, 1000. So in 1000 means for the whole plot. Then you see that uh, it's downsized to 142 by 71, and it's much quicker. And this one is has the same information. The value range a little bit different as we just had it. Probably there, there are some some maximum values, some some um, pixels, some raster cells have a value of 40 over here, and when they are aggregated, downsampled, um, they are a little bit lower. So different scale issues, etc. etc. So again, uh, what you see is because there are also negative values. You can set, uh, yeah, you can set the, the midpoint. As I, what I did with the presentation. So if I set the midpoint to 15, just to show you, uh, then 15 is, is uh, yellow. And if I do it, I would recommend to set n to an alt number. Then you have clearly have made it still C8 because of the bridge scale. It's still C8, um, I can, eight classes because we are Forced to use uh, thirty-five, and if I said n is nine, they still have eight classes. That's how the function pretty works. Uh, and if you look at the documentation and you go to the argument style, you see that all also. So I showed pretty and k means and font. Uh, but there are different, uh, there are many options. So this is made possible by this uh, package class over here. Okay, now I have uh, nine groups, uh, equal size classes. And now the middle color is yellow. And this is how a sequential diverging color palette should work. So you have like a one neutral color and two uh, sequential palettes in both directions. And if you, whatever you use uh, four or a five, a seven or nine, it's depending on the situation. Normally seven is what I would recommend. Because then you can also see 
difference see the color and also read the corresponding class so see this this green this one um, I think for now the last thing that I wanted to show is like or explain how to transform what yeah as, as already talked how to transform a war process but i'll briefly explain how team deals with that so what you already saw is that if you uh, want to uh, convert a star subject into a different crs which is now so if i look at the crs of p was the object from the uh, sitting and true data that I read here. So UTN, UTM zone uh, 32N. And when I plot it into an interactive map, because the base map is in, in uh, the web mercator reaction. Four, three, two, six. It has to be confirmed, and a conversion is either uh, a warp or uh, or a transformation. A transformation. That's the one that. Let's see. Transforming. So this is a typical warp. So that you see the the still the, the, the rectangles, and it's like a transformation. Uh, the thing is because all each pixel has to be converted to a polygon in order to plot it. So therefore, this one is slower than actually this. Is, this is the, the warp that I was referring about. And this one is much quicker than this one. So for well, most uses this one will do. There is an option. Let's see. Right. Um, there is an option roster not warp. By default, it's true. And if you set it to false, let's try. Let me show you this. It's only uh, 100 by 100 cells, thanks to the setting that I set. So therefore, it's, it's not so slow. But now you see that there are like, uh, yeah, little polygons. Like a motion. This one is nicer, but the other one is uh, faster. But when you zoom out, it's not so fast. I don't know why this appears by the way. Okay, so this one. Yeah, so I think that's it for my part. So if you have any questions or things that you want me to show, then let me know. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, any questions? No? Uh, well, uh, while you think, and if you have any question, I will share with you um, the last meetup we have. Um, I don't know if you see my screen. Do you see my screen? Let me know. We can see you. Okay.
Okay, that's the next meetup. We have an Error Ladies chapter. Thank you for all you guys uh, meet us today with Edsel and Martin. Um, also, I want to thank them for your time your, to share your knowledge with the Error Ladies community at Mexico. And so, anyone have another question? Something to share? No? Well, the only thing that I want to say is thank you, all of you, and we hope to see you again. Okay, thank you, Fairness. Thank you.